Um, so, I'm Abby. Um, a lot of this I haven't said outside of confessional yet, so if I start crying, just close your eyes, please. Um, I was asked to give my testimony on how I've experienced completing a work of mercy. Um, and I think I've had experiences with some of them, but I think the one that affected my life the most is probably to forgive wrongs willingly. Um, it's a little bit of an intense story. So, when I was a kid, someone really important in my life, full color, Jane, started using me. Um, I'd rather not go into the details while I'm on stage, but she taught me that my body is just a body. That it's a tool to have fun with and accomplish tasks with, and that it would determine how much I would be worth to someone. It was something I wasn't allowed to talk about with other people. And I just assumed that it was ordinary because little me hadn't quite grasped the concept of unordinary yet. I didn't realize exactly the depth of what happened until years later when I was able to step back from it and um, just view it objectively. So I was six when it started, and I was told that if I said anything to my parents or to anyone, that I would be in the wrong because it was my moral obligation to obey this person. And there were times that I eventually said yes, but I don't think that any six-year-old should really be presented with that question and expected to make a good decision. So, skipping ahead, throughout middle school, I struggled with a lot of eating disorders and over-exercising, and then um, there was just some bigger issues when I started seeing this girl following me around everywhere. Uh, she was me, but she looked exactly like me, but without everything that I hated about myself. Like, her nose wasn't as flat as mine, her waist was smaller, her hip discs weren't as prominent, she had like a perfect Chloe Ting set of abs, and she just glowed. Sorry, I <laughs> someone giggle. <laughs> um, when I couldn't see her, I could feel her or I could hear her, and she, I remember crying on my bathroom floor in my closet, and she would put her hands on my back, kind of the same way you would when you're comforting a friend, but in more of an affirming way, saying like, you deserve this feeling, like you should feel like this, this is your fault, you're an awful person, um, and just talking to me like that. I remember physically feeling the air of her whispers against my ear as she told me to hurt myself to hurt other people. And about a year after my experiences started with this girl, I started having sleep paralysis episodes. Um, I remember physically seeing and feeling a demon in my room, in my bed. And if you guys have ever had sleep paralysis, you know that that's like really scary. You don't ever want to do that. Um, so if you can avoid it, please do. Um, so fast forward to high school. I worked really, really intentionally on those eating disorders, on those over-exercising problems, and the girl began to go away. I started seeing her less, uh, feeling her less, hearing her less, but I began struggling with self-harm at this point. Um, it was kind of as if she left because she didn't need to be there to hurt me anymore because I was doing it all on my own. Eventually, it became a habit, and then it became a need. It was something that I, I had to do it to get through my day. I could not sleep at night. I hurt myself. So fast forward to the middle of my sophomore year, I just kind of stopped having emotions. I could like recognize the humor behind something, I could understand somebody else's emotions and empathize, but I didn't have any original feelings of my own. I didn't have any emotions that belonged to me. Um, I declared myself atheist at this point, despite still coming to mass and youth group, but I also had a little late choice. Um, my parents didn't know. Thank God they did. <laughs> Um, at this point, going back to Jane, my relationship with Jane was almost non-existent, and my current lifestyle and the people I was choosing to spend my time with weren't really helping that much. Um, we are just going to be always connected by the nature of who she is to me, but there was no want for me to talk to her. There was no relationship between her and me. And I was exhausted all the time, and then my mom got sick. And she'd been sick, but then she got like, really sick, like on her deathbed kind of sick. She's alive, but um, yeah. I wasn't capable of being the outfit or the big sister that my family needed me to be because I wasn't capable of making it through an entire day without <coughs> destroying the body that God made specifically and intentionally for me. I was in a fight with God, I was in a fight with myself, and while I was in this position, I just didn't have the bandwidth to be there for my family the way that I needed to be. I decided that they had to be my priority, and my siblings were all put in a private Catholic school. And even though I disagreed with the church, um, I thought that it wasn't my place to decide 
how my siblings should be raised and I should act in a way that aligned with the church's teachings more. Um, my parents wanted to raise their kids in the church and who was I to tell them that they couldn't. So going through those motions kind of inherently led to me looking for intention in those actions. I wanted to know why we received the Eucharist instead of taking it. I wanted to know why I couldn't have sex with someone before we were married, even if I really, really loved that person. I wanted to know why porn was a sin. I wanted to know why Jesus died for us if he knew that some of us might go to hell anyways. I had so many questions, and I didn't have the relationship with my parents at the time where I felt like I could bring these questions to them. So I looked for those answers all on my own. Um, I dove into my faith, specifically the parts that I struggled the most with. Um, and at some point, I had the revelation that although sin obviously affects your earthly relationships, the ultimate effect of sin is that you're distancing yourself from God. And the reason we don't sin is because it leads to hell, and hell is an eternity without God. Heaven is your soul and him being entirely united for forever, and hell is the pain of knowing that you could have had that and instead you chose to be away from someone who loves you and will always love you no matter what. So a sin against a man is a sin against God, and we can go to God for comfort, and God is ultimately the person or the being that decides how to handle that sin, then what was I doing, like still holding on to the pain from a sin that someone committed to me like a decade ago? I, after having that revelation, decided that I should let go of it. I decided that if God didn't exist, it wasn't helping me at all to be holding on to this. And if he did exist, and Jane had gone to confession like she said she had, and been forgiven by God himself, then who was I to decide that she wasn't worth his mercy and his forgiveness? And the moment that I made the decision to forgive her of an insane amount of physical tension that I wasn't even aware that I was holding on to was released. My ears like, felt like they opened up the way they do after they pop. There was a shiver down my arms and my spine and an odd warmth that just kind of came from the middle of my chest. The weight that I carried in my chest, that really specific anxiety feeling that's right here, that's just always there, melted away. And I no longer felt need to harm myself. I struggled with the want sometimes. I struggled with the want a lot but it didn't burn as painfully and as intentionally as it had before that decision. I realized that there's so much value in life when I'm, holding, when I'm not holding on to burdens that aren't mine. And I'm not Jane, so I don't know exactly how it affected her. Um, but I do know that two years ago we had no relationship and now she calls me with like her daily poop log. So there's, there's a relationship now. So the moral of the story here is that if God can create a world with northern lights and pink and purple sunsets and cars with sun with sunroofs and really loud speakers and the salty air of the beach and all these amazing things and entire ecosystems with billions and billions of individual organisms and people who have so many intricately woven systems that work perfectly together, then how can he be merciful and we can't? How can he, this all-powerful God who created all of these things, say that we're all worth forgiveness and I couldn't give that to someone, I who's just a small speck, a small person in this world of billions of people. So for me, I wasn't forgiving people for, I wouldn't forgive people just to do it. I forgave people for my own peace. Um, and to forgive someone is not to say that what they did is okay. It is never gonna be okay that for, Years when I was a kid, I had my body taken from me and I didn't have a choice in those matters. But it's to give that burden to God and to let Him handle it. It's not to say that it's okay, it's to say that I have a bigger purpose than to worry about what you did to me right now, and it happened and I won't let it happen again. It's to say that you're not going to allow somebody else's actions to pull you away from the peace and the purpose that God gave you, and that you're not going to allow Satan to interfere with the goal that God has for you life. It's not letting something go, it's just letting God deal with it. So for me, personally, the decision to forgive wrongs willingly is by far the best decision that I have made for myself and my relationships in my life. Thank you.